Welcome to the Futurati Podcast. Any member of the Futurati is somebody who believes in the power of the future. We know there's a better world ahead, and we indeed have the power to make it so. In our podcast, we talk to the best minds in the world about the most urgent problems facing mankind today, and we hope you learn as much from them as we do. I'm Thomas Fry, a professional futurist and keynote speaker. And I'm Trent Fowler, a machine learning engineer and author. Thank you for joining us. If you're like me, you've watched the blockchain space with growing interest in recent years, but you can be forgiven for not really understanding what the technology is good for outside of cryptocurrency. If so, you'll want to tune into this episode. Tonight, we're joined on the Futurati podcast by Jeremy Clark. Jeremy is an associate professor at the Concordia Institute for Information Systems Engineering, where he holds the Cadillacsi Industrial Research Chair in Blockchain Technologies. He obtained his PhD from the University of Waterloo, where his gold medal dissertation was on designing and deploying secure voting systems, including Scantegrity, the first cryptographically verifiable system used in a public sector election. He wrote one of the earliest academic papers on Bitcoin, completed several research projects in the area, and contributed to the first textbook. Beyond research, he has worked with several municipalities on voting technology and testified to both the Canadian Senate and House Finance Committees on Bitcoin. If you enjoy this interview, please subscribe to the podcast and share it with your friends. That really is the best way to help us grow. And don't forget to check out our website, futuratipodcast.com. Jeremy, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Let's hear a little bit about your background, your interests, and what brought you to working on the problems you're working on. Sure. So I'm a professor, uh, so I have an academic background. I did my PhD at the University of Waterloo, which is in Canada, and I'm currently at Concordia University, which is in Montreal, Canada. And uh, yeah, I'm a professor. My research interests look at uh, blockchain technology. Uh, My PhD was on voting technology as well. Uh, I come from a cryptography security background, computer science background. Uh, so we're interested in in those types of issues. Yeah. Have you actually created a, a blockchain from scratch? No, no, no. So uh, I, in fact, I wouldn't advise anyone to do it. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's one of those things where uh, you're much better to take something that exists and uh, there's really not a strong need to because with some blockchains, like newer ones like Ethereum, it's not so new now, but it was kind of the second generation of blockchain technology. You can actually deploy what you want on top of it. So you don't have to worry about the blockchain layer, which is just the layer that does all the communication, the network, makes sure that transactions get processed, uh, all of that type of stuff. So it'd be kind of like, like saying, uh, did you ever invent like your own private internet because you wanted to put a website up, right? <laughs> you would just put the web page up. Uh, you wouldn't bother with the, you would use the existing internet. And so that's how blockchain should operate today is you should take the existing blockchain technology, but then you can put the equivalent of, of your website, which would be your decentralized app or smart contract as they're called. And that's what you would customize and, and want to put up. Um, so I have put smart contracts on the web. My students have done it. We've designed those, uh, but we don't design at the layer below. Interesting. So are you relatively happy with the L1 solutions that exist? Because it's not like there's not people trying to build alternatives. Yeah. So um, L1, uh, just for your viewers, I don't know how right. savvy they are. Uh, it means layer one. And so uh, in this case, something like Ethereum would be considered uh, layer one. Bitcoin is the original uh, layer one. Bitcoin has limitations uh if you want to use it for anything other than payments right. so it's great uh for payments uh it's the original it broke new research ground uh ethereum allows you to build other things on top of it uh so you can build financial services and, and other types of things um both bitcoin and ethereum suffer from uh scalability issues uh so there's issues where Fundamentally, so blockchain is, you know, it's a secure technology. That's why as a security person, I'm interested in it. It's a cryptocurrency. Cryptography implies it's going to give you something in terms of security. And really what it does is um, it gives you very strong integrity. So if you ask for a transaction to be processed, it will be processed exactly the way that you asked for it to be processed. And even if the network could change it and they could take, say it's a billion dollar transaction, and it's supposed to be coming to me, but they could divert it into their own pockets, they won't be able to do that. Okay, so that's that's the security property uh, that it gives you. The cost for the security is every node looks at the transaction. 
every single node on the network. So there's thousands of nodes on the network. They're all going to look at that transaction. So it's not like, like say cloud computing, you go to Amazon and they also have thousands of nodes, but they just give you one server that's going to do your transaction for you. The one that's closest to right. you or the one that's free. But with blockchain, there's, there's, you know, every node is going to recompute it. They're all going to check the output. They're going to make sure that if one of the nodes is saying that the money goes to me, that all the other nodes agree on it. So ultimately there's going to be a scalability issue there, right? You just can't have thousands of nodes all process every single transaction and not have the system be slow or expensive. Um, so layer one um, now means the sort of bottom layer and it's uh, held in contrast to layer two. Uh, so layer two are kind of like side blockchains where they take a piece of what's happening on the blockchain. They run it, but they try and give you the same security properties. Um, so there's there's different types. Uh, there's things called optimistic roll-up, zero knowledge roll-up. So we can go through the details if, if you're interested. But I'm a huge fan of L2s. Uh, we were some of the first academics uh, to, to, to use Arbitrum, uh, which is one of these uh, optimistic roll-ups. And so we did some technologies on it. And uh, some of my students have gone on and worked at Off-Chain Labs. And uh, yeah, so, so I, I really like layer twos as well. Um, but I think the, the future, at least in the medium run, will be a, a sort of hybrid between layer ones and layer twos. Yeah, there's a big trend in the crypto space of, of creating a mainnet. And that's a way of separating kind of the, uh, the adults from the children, so to speak. Uh, so if it becomes this, this um, uh, kind of additional layer of capabilities that gets added into the these different cryptocurrencies. Is is a, a mainnet, is that considered an L1 or an L2? So the term is a little ambiguous, so different people might mean it in different things. Um, usually what would happen is you would take a project like Ethereum. So Ethereum is a layer one technology. But if I'm developing a dApp, I want to kind of try it out. Maybe I even want to get some users to try it out. Uh, but I also want to, you know, just do it as a test. So what Ethereum will do is they'll say, okay, we have a couple layer ones. We have the real, the real Ethereum where you pay real ETH in order to get your, uh, your transactions executed. And so that's called mainnet. And then what we have is we have a set of test nets. Uh, where you still need ETH, but it's basically free. You can just write, you know, post something on Twitter and a bot will send you a bunch of ETH. It's fake ETH, you can't use it on mainnet, uh, but you can use it for testing purposes. And you could, uh, so, so like, for example, the Arbitrum project, it ran for many months on testnet. And there were real users using it and people were, um, you know, trying it out and they wanted to make sure that it really, really works so that when they switched the mainnet, there wouldn't be any glaring issues with it. And so, so dev but, prod, dev and prod, but for blockchains. Yeah, 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 exactly. Fantastic. What are some of the L2 projects that you find the most exciting? Fr frankly, I, I've always been kind of a Bitcoin guy and I've, I've worked as a machine learning engineer at a couple different crypto asset startups and I'm at a, at a blockchain analytics company now, but I've never really gotten super into the whole L2 landscape and, and the ZK rollups and what all those things mean, but I will be doing more of that in the future. So just feel free to disgorge as much knowledge as you want to on that subject. Okay, okay. Yeah, I can give you a kind of lay of the land. So first, there's L2s on Bitcoin and there's L2s on Ethereum, and they're going to be a little bit different. So on Bitcoin, because it's primarily a payment transaction or a payment network, uh, L2s are also for payments, but they're going to try and solve two problems that you have with Bitcoin. They're, they're actually kind of the same problem. Um, one is that it, it takes a long time to get your payment fully confirmed. Uh, so you got to get it in a block. It's going to take about 10 minutes. Uh, for it to be included in a block. And then if you really want to be sure that the money's moved and it's final, you're going to have to wait six blocks. So that could be an hour. Right. Um, so what we want to do is we want to do it faster. And the, the way that we do it faster also solves the second problem, which is that you don't necessarily have to be connected to the Bitcoin network in order to do a transaction. So there's some way that we could do the transaction off chain and then later come back and settle it on chain. So things like Lightning Network, I, I'm sure you some of your listeners have heard of, uh, it's probably the biggest project. I would consider that an L2. Uh, it's an L2 on Bitcoin, it's for payments. Uh, it's very fast. You don't have to talk to the Bitcoin network except for when you wanna finally settle all your accounts. So you can make a whole bunch of payments to different people. And then at the end of the month, you just kind of settle them all and, and you get the real money in your hand. Um, so that's how that works. 
Uh, the problem with it, the criticism of it is uh, in order to send money, it has to be kind of prepaid. So it's a prepaid model. It's kind of like a gift card. Like if, if you have a gift card, you don't have to use real money. You don't have to use the banking system. If I get a gift card for the store, it's just the store's internal database. So it's really fast, but I have to load it up in advance. And so same with Lightning is you have to load the money up that you want to send in advance. Uh, so it, it doesn't work for all use cases as a result. Then uh, if, if you want to interject a question, go for it. Well, I was but. just curious. So does that mean you just have to have a balance in order to send a payment? Because that doesn't seem like a huge hurdle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it, I, I'm not saying it's huge, but let's take a concrete example. Let's say I want to pay my, I don't know, internet bill. And I want to pay it um, for the year, right? Uh, so what I have to do is I do have to send one real Bitcoin transaction to populate my balance, right? But I'd have to lock up a year's worth of payments, right? I see on day one, then I could send those 12 payments. And then at the end of the year, we close our accounts and the and the cable company gets gets the real money, right? Um, but do I have 12 times my monthly payment available today? And maybe I do for my internet, but do I have it for my internet and my hydro and my groceries or wh whatever all I wanna use it with, right? Yeah. Now the Lightning people will say, well, your paycheck will come to you in Lightning, right? So you're gonna get money in through Lightning and then you can turn around and send it out. So as long as your money's sort of coming in, then you don't need to have this big balance. And so it, anyways, it gets into some sort of economics of it. And yeah. so it is the kind of system that works pretty well if everything's on Lightning, but if you're mainly using it to pay others and never receiving money, then it doesn't work so well. Um, I see. Or, or at least you have to have a lot of capital up front. So, so it needs to internalize more of those users in order to reduce the friction enough to make it a sensible use case. Otherwise, interfacing with other systems is far more difficult. Yeah, yeah. So the the so what turns it into a network? So they say Lightning Network is that they try to arrange. Uh, different intermediaries that you might have in common with different people. So you don't have to have individual channels to all the different people. You can pay sort of a hub and the hub has connections to all, all sorts of other people. So a lot of the, the um, coordination uh, that needs to happen, uh, that's why Lightning is hard and that's why it's a big project and there's lots of people and a lot of investment. Uh, in it is is trying to get that sort of coordination problem solved. Okay. So so is there anybody specializing in micropayments? Um, this seems yeah, yeah. to be a, okay. So so Lightning that could be a third problem you could argue that it solves. So in Bitcoin the fees are reasonably expensive, and you're basically priced out of like a true micro transaction, right? Right. So like if you want to pay ten cents to listen to this podcast. Right, you can't. Uh, you're not going to use a cryptocurrency for that because the fee is going to be more than ten cents. Um, and so, Lightning is is suitable for micropayments. Uh, so you could use it. Uh, that would be an application of it. So if you want to trickle small amounts of money instead of seeing ads or something to the websites you're visiting and things like that, uh, that's a use case that people have talked about for these types of payments. Okay. So, okay. And then we, we interrupted you. So you were talking about the lay of the land for L2s. We went, went oh, yeah. to Lightning. Okay. So let's move to Ethereum then. So Ethereum is a little different because you're not just doing a payment. So a payment's a pretty easy thing from a computer science perspective. You have a basically a sender, a receiver, and an amount. And that's all you have to keep track of. On Ethereum, you have arbitrary compute computations that people are running. Right, so they dream up some code, they put it on Ethereum, and it's going to execute it. And so uh, your layer two needs to be able to fully execute code. It can't just as make assumptions about what the code is. And so layer twos on Ethereum are, are much more complicated. So generally, what they do is they replicate the way Ethereum does computations. It's kind of like complicated, but there's this thing called the EVM, Ethereum Virtual Machine, and it's right. basically the the state of the world on Ethereum. Uh, of all the contracts, basically every token, every contract on Ethereum, it's all like in a big computer system. And every time you do a transaction, you kind of like run that computer system a little bit to move money around or advance the state of contracts. And so what roll up, or sorry, what layer twos will do is they'll take that same EVM and they'll move it off chain. And what they'll do is they'll advance the EVM off chain and then periodically they'll sync it back. Okay, so they'll, they'll let you do, uh, say, a thousand transactions off chain, and then they'll put all those thousand transactions together, and then they'll just say, okay, if you run these a thousand transactions, you'll go from this version of the world to this version of the world, and we're not going to make you do all the intermediate steps. You can just leap uh, from the one to the other. Now, the problem is that you could try and get them to leap to a state of the world that's wrong. 
right? So you need some proof that 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 what you're going to do uh, is is correct. That that the, taking this leap is is correct. And so in that case, layer two split into two types. So one type uh, is called an optimistic rollup, and what they do is they basically say someone's going to assert that this is the correct new state of the world, okay? And any and they're going to stake some money, so they're going to use incentives. So they're going to say, you know, here's a whole bunch of of ETH. And if you can prove that it's wrong, then uh, you can keep some of my ETH, okay? So I'll stake it and I'll get slashed if I'm wrong. And so basically what happens is they just assert what it is. You wait around for like a week and anybody can come along and say, no, it's, it's not right. But it's not sufficient to just say, no, it's wrong. You have to point out exactly where they went wrong, okay? So you have to say, you know, and so there's all these like little steps. So there's like, a million steps and you say at step five you know up to five hundred thousand four hundred and thirty six that that is correct but that next step that's the step that's wrong uh and so then what will happen is ethereum itself you go back to the layer one it will execute just that one step and decide who's telling the truth about what the next step is um and then it will it will uh, allocate the money it will slash the person that that basically was on the wrong side and give it to the person that was on the right side so is that is that actually faster that that sounds incredibly complicated it, does that actually solve latency issues like uh, it's hard yeah, to so believe. The, the way it solves the latency issues is um because you're leaping forward with the evm you can you can bundle together as many transactions as you want so when you go off chain onto the layer two uh, you can run it as fast as your computers can run. Uh, and then you just come back periodically and sync the new state of the world. And so uh, because you're you're sort of fast forwarding through the states of the world, uh, you can you can do that as as quickly as you want. I don't okay. know if this analogy is working for you, but no, no, no. It, I, I understand what you're saying conceptually. Like just on an intuitive level, it seems like there's yeah. so much involved. It's hard for me to believe that's actually quicker than just executing it on the L1. But I mean, I've worked with computers long enough to know that when you stack up, you know, tiny little increments and millions of steps, it actually adds up to a lot. So I, I, I buy it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And th another thing is to think about why. So on L1, remember every node on the network has to execute all right. of those steps, right, right. right? So that's actually where the savings, it's, it's not, it's partly the speed, how fast can you get through those steps? But it's also the fact that you just have a couple people that are doing it and syncing it back and the other people are checking it instead of having everybody on the network do it. So instead of 10,000 people doing every transaction, you, you have 10 people or 100 people doing it. And is, is it really the case that these L2s and in particular these rollups have the same security guarantees or privacy guarantees as the L1s underneath do? Because that seems like a, a fairly big leap to me. Okay, uh, let's separate uh, security and privacy. So privacy, okay. nothing on L1 has privacy on Ethereum. Okay. Uh, if you go to a privacy coin or if you put a DAP on top of Ethereum like Tornado Cash or something like that, you can try and introduce privacy. But basically out of the box, blockchain gives you no privacy. Rollups were like the early literature suggests that maybe they do something on privacy, but the truth is they don't. So, okay. so just set privacy aside. Basically, you're not going to get any privacy from from an L2. Okay. Um, even when you use zero knowledge, which I'll talk about in a second. Yeah, please. Um, you still don't get privacy. Uh, in terms of security, it should give you very comparable security. Um, the incentives are slightly different. So instead of every miner looking at every transaction. Now you have a smaller subset of people that are looking at it. So you might say, well, that's kind of a reduction in security. I think that's fair. Um, like you say, it's a very complicated system. And so you have these bridge contracts, which are the contracts that um, sort of register all the transactions that you want run on the L2. And then when the new state of the world comes back to L1, it comes through the bridge as well. Bridges are incredibly complicated. If there's any sort of security bug in the bridge, uh, then, then you know, then it doesn't work, right? And so we've seen hacks where people right. hack the bridge of a layer two the and Ronin they steal bridge. all the money. Yeah, and um, so, so in that case, you can't say really it's equivalent to L1. But let's say that in theory you could do a perfect bridge, right? Then the other, the final issue is usually, you know, we talk about smart contracts on blockchains as being immutable. So once you put the code up, you can't change it. And it is kind of more or less true, 
but what developers developers don't like immutability because it means if there's a security problem you can't fix it right so what they do is they go they bend over backwards trying to add upgradeability to a system that doesn't allow upgradeability and so there's all sorts of complicated ways of doing it but just to give you kind of a picture they'll, they'll use like a proxy contract where you call a contract and it calls another contract and it looks like you're just calling one contract but there's this indirection and then if they want to upgrade the contract they change that second contract so you still call into the same proxy but the proxy forwards you to a new contract <laughs> and then it, and then the result comes back and then there's a whole mess of like how do you get the state moved from the first contract to the second if you upgrade and like it gets really complicated we actually have a paper uh that's being presented on friday uh, about it if anyone wants to really dig into the details yeah. but um so back to bridges uh bridges usually have upgradeability because you want it from a security perspective. But that also means that somebody can upgrade the contract. Someone has the power to do it. So normally that, that actually is part of the security flaw that happened recently with the bridge is someone was able to get that key, right? That controlled the bridge. Now, if you have upgradeability, you can get the key that controls the upgradeability, then you could upgrade the bridge to a new version of the bridge that's malicious and then steal everyone's money that way. Um, and so, Anyway, so so this stuff is super complicated. It's way too simple to say it's exactly equivalent in terms of security uh, between L2 and L1. Uh, in a perfect world, if you could write perfect code, you could argue that it's more or less equivalent. But the reality, I think, you know, in, in the real world, L2s are going to be a little less secure than, than operating on L1. Okay, but on the whole, the benefits you get in exchange are, are worth that trade-off. That's the hope anyway. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. And if it's time tested and uh you know it's been around for a while and people are using it and there aren't issues and the team seems responsive and things like that i i would like trust it as much as you trust in l1 you can have errors in l1 too right we've seen bugs there's bugs in bitcoin uh there have been bugs in ethereum and so yeah yeah how, how is it that a zero knowledge roll up does not give you a privacy guarantee okay so let's talk about that so uh zero knowledge proofs are um so they come from cryptography and normally it is a proof where I'm going to prove to you something without revealing what it is. Right. So here's a simple example that mathematically is not a zero knowledge proof, but it's it's technically a cut and choose, but it's simple enough that, that you know, everyone can understand it. So let's say I hand you an envelope and it's sealed and I tell you there's a hundred dollar bill in this envelope and I want you to sign it endorsing it so that if some, and you're not going to be able to open it up but you're gonna endorse it. And if someone in the future opens it up and there isn't a hundred dollars, they're gonna come and get the hundred dollars from you. Okay. So could I actually convince you to sign that envelope, right? So that that's sort of a hard problem. And intuitively you think, no, like there's no way I would ever sign it. You couldn't convince me. If I can't open it, I don't know what's in it, right? right? So what if I gave you a hundred envelopes and I said, okay, they all have a hundred dollars in them. Pick one from the pile, open it up and check and you can see that there's a hundred dollars okay then pick another one open it up and check and then you go through 99 and you're holding that last envelope right you're pretty sure there's a hundred dollars in it yeah yeah and okay. so you might sign it you know you're, you're not 100 percent sure you're technically 99 percent sure but I, I at least increase your confidence so that's kind of like what a zero knowledge proof does a zero knowledge proof gives you the confidence that something's true without showing it to you. The only difference is that it can take the probability that it's true from 99% to like 99.9999999999% or whatever. Right, right. Um, so it can, it can really amp it up. Now, what people started doing maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, is they came up with a way of doing zero knowledge proofs where the proofs themselves are very short. So these are called succinct proofs uh, and they're called SNARKs. And the original, uh, okay. the original application was as follows. Let's say I have a computation and I want it done, but I'm on a mobile phone. It's too expensive for me to run this computation on my phone. So I want to give it to a cloud and the cloud's going to compute it for me. Okay. And then the, the cloud tells me, okay, this is the answer. This is the result of the computation. And then I'm not sure. I don't know if I trust the cloud. Okay. So I say, well, could the cloud prove to me that it did it correct? Could it use some sort of proof, some mathematical proof? And the answer for, for a long time was yes, but then you would have to check the proof 
And if you check the proof, it's going to be as expensive as just running the computation itself. Mm -hmm. Usually it's going to be more expensive, right? Yeah. It'll be like 10 times. So you, you might as well just run it. So it's not going to, it's not going to save you. And so the idea of these snarks or succinct proofs was someone showed that there is a way where you can actually get a proof and you can check the proof faster than you could actually run the computation itself. Now there's two variants of it. There's just a snark, not a ZK snark, not a zero knowledge snark, just a snark. Snark stands for a succinct non-interactive arguments of knowledge, just if you're interested. But the S, the succinct part is, is the one that I'm putting the emphasis on. So there's just snarks, which basically just prove that someone did it correctly. And then a zero knowledge uh, snark is a snark, but there's some secrets. So like, like it's like an envelope and there's some stuff in the envelope and they're proving to you what's in the envelope without opening the envelope up. Um, so what people use in rollups is they just use normal snarks. They don't use ZK snarks. Now, if you're not a cryptographer, you just use the terms interchangeably. Right, people talk about zero knowledge or snarks, and like there's no no one makes the distinction in their mind. So if you go out, you're going to hear people talk about zk rollups, like a zero knowledge rollup. Technically, it's not zero knowledge; it's a, it's a non zero knowledge snark rollup. Right. Okay. So there there is some terminology, and if you're really an expert in the area, you you might use more careful terminology. But that's why a zk rollup doesn't provide any privacy, is because it's not actually using a, a zero knowledge proof; it's just using a succinct proof of correctness I anyways <laughs> so then what how does a roll-up work so a roll-up is just like that cloud computing example so you take a bunch of ethereum transactions you execute them off chain as fast as you can and then you say this is the end result and then you provide that proof and you send it to a smart contract and ethereum smart contract can execute that proof and be like yes I believe that that proof is correct. And it took me less time to verify the proof than to just actually do all of those transactions. Okay, so ZK snark is actually great. Uh, they're, they're, or sorry, a, a ZK rollup, they're, they're, it's, it's actually better than an optimistic rollup uh, in terms of it's, it's a lot simpler. It gives you directly what you want. Uh, it's very efficient. Uh, the problem with it is that that prover, that the time it takes to generate that proof can be very expensive. Right. So that server has to generate this proof in order to convince you. It's it's quick for you to verify it, but the reason it's quick to verify is because the prover put extra work in order to like kind of shrink it down. It's like a PNP so, problem. Yeah, yeah. And so it could it could be like it could create it might not solve the scalability issue basically. So so instead of having a thousand nodes doing like little computations, you have one node but it's doing a huge computation. And so at some point there's going to be like a crossover where the one system gets more efficient than the other. And we don't know where that is in terms of practical terms. And, you know, the snark technology is improving and people are just implementing it now. And anyway, there's companies like Starkware, uh, they're, they're the leaders in that space. Uh, and uh, oh, uh, another thing I might mention about ZK rollups is um, there, there's, so this snark technology is used actually in two places in, in blockchain. It, it's used all over, but there's two places that you're most likely to encounter it. One is in this roll-up technology. The other place is if you look at a, a protocol like Zcash, uh, it uses it, they, it uses the true, like the zero knowledge snark in order to provide, um, in order to provide privacy. Um, and so that's like a Bitcoin alternative. It's just for payments. It's not like Ethereum. It doesn't let you run computations. Now, there's also a subtle, if you look at Starkware and what they're giving you in their rollups and you look at the snarks, you might notice just when I'm saying it, there's a slight difference between S-T-A-R-K, Stark, and Snark, S-N-A-R-K. And so there's, it's a small difference, but it's actually a pretty substantial difference. So. The Snark technology is more mature. There's better tools for it, but it requires this very elaborate ceremony where a bunch of people have to come together. They have to compute some values and then they have to throw their computers away. And if anyone was able to reconstruct what they did during that ceremony, then they could break different properties of the system. So in zero cash, in Zcash's case, it would be they could mint infinite amounts of money. Um, so you might have heard it was in the news just last week that Edward Snowden was one of the people that uh, was involved in the original ceremony uh, for Z Zcash's like their first uh, ceremony. And there's a really good another podcast, Radio Lab, did a, a good um, uh, episode on that whole ceremony and, and how it worked and things like that. Anyways, what Starkware is offering on the roll-up side 
gets rid of the trusted setup. So when you go from a snark to a stark, you don't need that trusted setup anymore. But it gets more expensive. So it right now it's a, a more expensive protocol to run, but it doesn't have that trusted setup. So going beyond uh, monetary uses, uh, what are what are the industries that are going to be most affected by um, blockchain use moving into the future? And uh, which ones do you think have the most promise? Uh, I know you've done some work on voting systems, uh, but I'm, I'm thinking there's probably lots of industries that are going to be touched as well as um, th there's a lot of uh, false assumptions out there that, uh, that this can solve all kinds of problems that it really can't solve. Yeah, so the, the industries that I'm most excited about are probably the ones that are closest to the original purpose, which was payments. So it works well for payments. It's a competitor to different payment systems that we have today. I don't see a world where blockchain technology replaces uh, payment systems like the banking payment system, the large value transfer system between uh, commercial banks, international payment systems like SWIFT. Um, I, I don't see it uh, replacing it fully, but I do see it as competing with it. Uh, and so I think we'll live in a world where there's a crypto option and then there's sort of like a main street uh, financial system option. And then when you move uh, away, like if payments is the center ring, the next biggest ring would be like finance. Uh, so that's where we are today. We see on Ethereum, there's lots of use cases around finance. Um, you have lending protocols, uh, you have uh, stable coins, which are a kind of derivative. You have other synthetic assets. Uh, so what they do is they try and give you a product that lets you speculate on the price of another asset, which could be on-chain, but it could also be an off-chain uh, solution. If it's off-chain, you normally need what's called an oracle. So an oracle is like a system that sits and it pulls real-world prices and feeds it into the blockchain because the blockchain can't go out and get real-world prices for reasons that are sort of complicated. I'll plug another paper that I wrote recently on Oracle. So if you want to know all about Oracles, uh, you can you can read that. Um, but but anyway, the, the finance is, is the most interesting. Now, why why is it competing with traditional finance? Right. And so I don't know that everyone has a full answer, but definitely one of the answers is that it's underregulated or unregulated, uh, depending on, on what exactly you're trying to do. And so there's a lot of red tape. Uh, using traditional finance, not just as a user, but in particular, if you want to be a provider. If you want to provide financial services, uh, you can't just start a bank, you can't start a lending company, you can't start an exchange. Uh, but on Ethereum, you can. If you can code it, right, then you can do it and you can deploy it tomorrow and you can actually leave, right? You can just put the code up walk away, never touch it again for 10 years. And in 10 years, there might be billions of dollars flowing through it. Um, so it's, it's a very different uh, kind of model. Uh, so it works well if you want to circumvent uh, regulation. Um, regulators will catch up. I work a lot with our financial regulator uh, in Quebec. And um, you, know, you, you hear a lot from the US. I guess you guys don't do politics, but but anyways, the, the regulators are um, they, they are watching this space closely and, and you can see that there's different different people have different opinions on, on how to regulate the space. But um, anyways, so, so unregulated finance is another big uh, use case. Recently, we've seen things like NFTs. So this is artwork and other like digital assets of, of value that are unique. Um, I, I think that's a bit of a bubble. Uh, a bubble doesn't mean that it's not worth worth anything. I mean, housing went through a bubble. It's not like you can get a free house after right. the bubble pops. Right. Um, I, I just think it's it's the values are overinflated. Uh, but but I think there is something real there uh, that's interesting. Um, people have more ambitious visions for, you know, a, a metaverse and a fully decentralized internet and, and things like that. I don't I don't know if those will come to fruition. I think the main limitation still is that Ethereum is slow. And so if you want your web browser to ping the Ethereum system every time it wants to check a certificate or something like that. Um, it, it seems like a pretty expensive proposition, uh, but hopefully maybe in 10 years, this blockchain technologies will, will become cheaper and cheaper. And there'll be, there'll definitely be, there'll be more use cases uh, the cheaper that, that it becomes. 
So in the introduction to this episode, I, I noted that you helped build Scantegrity, which is what one of the only cryptographically verifiable systems used in an actual election. This came up in our interview with Scott Rudy, and we kind of went back and forth on the potential of putting elections on blockchains and what the problems might be, the benefits might be. Given that you're sort of a domain expert, why don't you walk us through what that would be like and your experiences in particular building the system? Sure. Um, okay, so Scantegrity is an example of a cryptographic voting system. Uh, we developed it right when Bitcoin was coming out in the first place. In fact, we, we designed it before Bitcoin even came out. So it's not a blockchain-based voting system, but I can talk in a bit about how you might combine the two. But what it does do is it uses a lot of the same cryptography that's used in blockchain. And in fact, if for people that are interested, if you look at the history of the cryptographic voting systems, it's like very intertwined with the history of uh, digital payments. So. Uh, for example, they were both invented by the same person uh, back in 1981. David Chom uh, came up with the first cryptographic voting system. And then a year later, he came up with the first digital cash system. Now, his design is very different than Bitcoin. It's not decentralized. It's a centralized system. Um, but, you know, Satoshi talked about the differences between Bitcoin and, and the Chomian systems. And, uh, you know, his his work was super influential over all the cypherpunks and and you know sort of the community that that Satoshi was interacting with the crypto mailing lists and things like that where he was discussing Bitcoin uh, in the in the early days of Bitcoin. Um, so David Chom uh, is someone I started working with when I was a master's student, and we started working on he he got into voting primarily. So in the '90s he did digital cash. He had a product called DigiCash. Company kind of blew up. Um, lots of smart people went through that company. They ended up, you know, in, in uh, important roles in academia and in industry. But anyways, by, by the time I met him, he had shifted his focus to voting. Uh, and so Scantegrity was a project that came out of that. Uh, we had a system before. We actually ran it at my university for a student election. It was kind of cumbersome to use. And so Scantegrity was meant to be, you know, to take all the lessons that we learned and to try and apply them. Now, let me say what it is first. So cryptographic voting means that when you cast your ballot, you can be sure that it ends up in the final tally. And you can be sure that no one modified it. So what it's going to do is it's going to give you some sort of receipt that lets you trace your ballot as it goes through the tallying process. The problem with the receipt is you could prove to someone else how you voted. Right. So you could just put a serial number or actually a simple system would be you could just write someone's name and how they voted. Right. Then everyone can check that that their vote is recorded correctly. Right. But then everyone would know how everyone else voted. Right. So what we want to do is this is where the cryptography comes in, is we want to give you that receipt capability, but we don't want you to be able to show someone else how you voted. So you can't sell your vote. You can't be coerced. Uh, in voting a certain way. And, you know, in 10 years, the government's not going to know how you voted. Um, so, so that's where crypto comes in. And so the solution is to use that analogy of here's a list of people and here's your votes. What you could do is you could just wrap the votes in encryption, right? Uh, so, so you could have your name, but then you could have an encrypted version of your vote. And then what you could do is you can, uh, there's this special kind of encryption it's called homomorphic encryption where you can actually compute on values after they're encrypted mm -hmm. and one thing that you can do pretty easily is you can add ciphertext together so what you can do is you can kind of add up everyone's votes get the final tally and then just decrypt the final tally and then you can throw some of those zero knowledge proofs in to prove that you decrypted it correctly now the big problem with end-to-end -end voting from the 80s when when David invented it to around the time that we were working on it, maybe just before around 2002, 2004, is everyone assumed, OK, voters go in the voting booth and they start encrypting things, right? I'm going to vote for Alice. I'm going to encrypt it. Well, how, how are you going to encrypt it? Do you have a smartphone? Like people didn't even have smartphones back then. Are you bringing your computer into the laptop, like a uh, laptop into the ballot box? You know, what about everyone? Like not everyone has computers. Uh, not everyone can use them. Um, and so the idea was, could we get people to vote and encrypt it, encrypted, I put sort of in quotes, on paper? Is there a way that we could basically get like sort of a paper equivalent? And so there was a lot of iterations that went through. And there are ways of giving a very strong paper-based encryption, but they're not very usable. So Scantegrity was kind of a compromise. It was a compromise where 
it doesn't give you perfect privacy. So it's going to be an optical scan system. So you're going to vote on paper and then the scanner is going to, uh, it's going to see how you voted and it actually knows how you vote. It sees your real vote. Uh, whereas the earlier systems, you could protect your privacy even from the scanner itself. Uh, but, but then once it's beyond the scanner, the EA, the election officials, the election authority EAs, election authority, uh, all the voting officials, no one knows how you voted. And you're going to post a bunch of proofs that things were tallied correctly and you can look through all the proofs and no one will be able to uh, trace your ballot through. So the way it works is really simple. So think of an optical scan ballot. So you would get a ballot and you would vote for president and say it's between Alice and Bob. And there would be a little oval and you would color it in. If you want to vote for Alice, you would make it a dark circle. And then it would go through a scanner and the scanner would pick up that the circle beside Alice was darker than the circle beside Bob. And it would count it. It would claim to count it for Alice, but you don't really know. Right. So what we did is we use invisible ink. And so we wrote a little code. It was a pseudo random code. Uh, like just three digits or something like that inside the oval. And then you would mark it with a special pen. So you would basically mark beside Alice, you would color in the oval, and then this number would appear, 536. And every oval on every ballot in the whole election was different, or it was, they were all randomly assigned. Okay, so what you could do is you could write that down. You could write 536 down. You could take it home with you. You could show whoever you wanted to. It doesn't prove that you voted for Alice or Bob. You could even write, I voted for Alice and we got 536. But the truth is you could have voted for Bob and got that number, right? And then there's a whole bunch of crypto that I won't walk you through because it's it's hard and it's, it's, it's too hard to say in words. It's easier if you have some diagrams or something like that. But there's a bunch of crypto that makes sure that those codes get mapped to the correct candidate. So you can go on a website, you type in your ballot number and it will say, we recorded 536 for you. So you do that check. And then there's going to be a zero knowledge proof that proves that 536 is going to get mapped to Alice in the final tally. Uh, you know, And yeah, it doesn't even matter how corrupt the EA is. If they all collude with each other, you can still cryptographically prove it. Okay, I wanted to ask you about a scenario that I had drafted up a few years ago. It was about... Okay creating a global election and working with the people at the, the Nobel Foundation in Norway to, um, uh, to create an election surrounding the Nobel Peace Prize. Now, this is a relatively harmless area. Um, we're not uh, electing a global leader or anything, but uh, it, the idea of, of having the Nobel Foundation actually select four candidates and then the, like 60 days before the election and then having the people of the world vote on it. And, uh, and then uh, kind of the scenario that I put together said that um, everybody in the world got very wound up in this. And on election day, um, 765 million people voted from 127 different countries. And the, the person that got elected suddenly became the most famous person on planet Earth. Um, is, that, is that a realistic scenario? Is that possible sometime in the future? Okay, so that type of scenario on a smaller scale is possible. So, for example, the Oscars, they use a voting system. I know the company that makes it. Um, the difference between it and your scenario is twofold. So one is you have a lot more voters. Yeah. So you, you do have to start worrying about performance. And if you're going to throw cryptography on top, there are some bottlenecks that could emerge. So Scantegrity would be able to handle it, but some fancier uh, crypto voting systems, you might have a problem with, with that size. But then you could also break it into smaller chunks, like sort of like precincts or something like that. There might be, there might be ways to sidestep the scalability issue. The other difference is that in the Oscars, you have a closed list. Right? You have the members of the Academy and everyone knows who they are. In your case, you have an open, well, it's kind of a closed list, right? But you don't know if I'm gonna vote, I could vote a thousand times and you don't know that I'm one person or a thousand, you know, a thousand different people or, or a thousand or one person pretending to be a thousand different people. Um, so the main, that's your main problem is, is that you, you don't have control over the voter list uh, and you don't have unique identities. If you had an identity system, then it, it would work flawlessly. Um, now, th there are some crypto, there's there's this like thing called WorldCoin, I think. Yeah. Uh, there was a good article that just came out in MIT uh, Tech uh, Review that I have a quote in 
about it and they were going around and they were like they had this orb and they were scanning people's irises because they were trying to build uh not for the purposes of voting for the purposes of of uh universal basic income and they had some other ideas but they were trying to build like kind of a database of, of all humans um lots of privacy implications and and it seems like it's kind of vaporware at this point um but 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 anyway so so anyway that that's your fundamental problem is just that you would have to somehow identify individuals what do you okay. what do you see as the future for voting systems like this like cryptographically secured voting systems or blockchain based voting systems there's a lot of a lot of excitement around it but i'm sure like most things the scalability issues will be kind of serious usability issues will be kind of serious plus just getting people to to buy into it um okay or, yeah so in our experience First off, we had a weird system because we had invisible ink. So we literally had to like hack inkjet printers and we we like David like got all this like, he worked with a chemist to actually develop the invisible ink itself and the ink that reacts. And we had this shielding agent. So if you're looking at a black light trying to read what the code is before you actually mark the ballot, <laughs> you can't do it. And um and so there was all sorts of work that went into it. And so that's why we use Scantegrity in Tacoma Park, which is a, a suburb of Washington, DC. Uh, but we only we ran it twice. We published our academic papers. We were all like kind of PhD students. There's and there were some professors as well. But all the PhD students kind of went and got jobs or they became professors. And no one was interested in running that project anymore. And it re just required so much manual labor that Tacoma Park couldn't do it themselves. So it wasn't a turnkey solution that we delivered to them. It was a very like custom kind of job. We we talked about maybe turning into a company. Um, the, the problem uh, is also the voting industry itself. So the voting industry is, is very, you have a couple big players and they tend to get smaller over time. Uh, so in the US at the time, there were four big voting companies. Uh, now there's maybe two or three. And uh, there's a lot of regulation and it costs a lot to get machines certified. And it's really hard to, to, to make headway in that space. Uh, the um, counties that, that buy the equipment, they're running on really tight budgets. Uh, they're not allowed to, they don't have money to like renew their systems very often. Um, uh, there was in Florida 2000 in the US, there was a controversial election. And then after there was a whole bunch of money that was given up to upgrade the infrastructure called Help America Vote Act. And that act uh, was right around the time that these ATM style machines called DREs where that's what the voting machines happen. So that was the one time in, in the US history recently where they had a lot of money to go out and buy them. But unfortunately they went and bought these machines and they were completely insecure. Um, and so anyways, so the cryptographic voting never worked its way into election companies. Some election companies offer, like they'll say, well, we give you a receipt, kind of like I described with Scantegrity. But when you look at the cryptography, it doesn't actually trace all the way to your vote. Right, it goes through some central trusted party, and the trusted party just kind of moves things around. And if you trust them, then then your vote counts. It's not truly end-to-end -end verifiable. So I think what's happening is uh, companies have kind of given the veneer of being cryptographically verifiable, and the people who are buying the systems don't have a choice. They have to run an election, and if if four companies are offering them systems and none of them have crypto in it, then they can't do anything about it. They have to choose one of them. Right. You have to run your election. So you're going to choose one of them anyways. And so, yeah, it's sort of a supply demand problem. Why like this true end to end verifiable technology didn't work its way yet into it. Uh, the governments could step in so they could add regulation. And uh, the EAC in the U.S. has looked at, you know, trying to, to come up with some language around end to end verifiable voting systems and things like that. But it's never like been really enshrined and they're voluntary guidelines anyways. And so anyway, so the, the situation's complicated, but I wouldn't hold my breath. Everyone's yeah. like on the same page that crypto voting would be better, but companies aren't offering it. They don't really have an incentive to change unless if their competitors started offering it. There's a coordination and so problem. We're in this sort of stalemate where no one's offering it, so no one has to offer it, and then you can't even buy it if you want it. Right. Isn't it possible to use some sort of biometric verification so that nobody can vote twice? Uh, yeah, so you you um have a couple issues with it. So, so it is possible. There are some countries like India uh, that, that use it, uh, not for their entire population, but they use it for like certain large districts. Um, the, the problem is you need to register everyone in advance. So you have to get the person's biometrics 
And that's where you're going to have a problem in the U.S. if you if the government goes around and, and gets everyone's fingerprints, right, or, or their irises or whatever. Uh, there's going to be a privacy issue, even if, if the government claims they're only going to use it for elections. And then if you were able to do it, um, it... Uh, it still doesn't allow you to vote from home, for example, unless if you have a way of, you know, of, of getting your biometric into your device. So some devices have it, but not everyone has like an iPhone with a fingerprint or, you know, a face scanner or whatever. So you have a, everyone has different technologies. Lots of people have no technology. And so it, it, it's not so you're still going to a, a, a voting booth. You're still showing up in person and you're, you're voting in person. And at that point, if you have some sort of ID with a photo, it's almost as good as as having a biometric. So it I, it's it's sort of you're sort of solving a problem that doesn't need to be solved in my view. I would say. In preparation for this interview, I read another one of your papers, Bitcoin's academic pedigree, in which you make the case that most all of the underlying technology for Bitcoin is plucked from research that was published in the 1980s and 1990s. The reason for laying that case out is to highlight the actual innovation of Bitcoin, which is pasting them all together into a system that actually works. And I, I thought that was just a really excellent discussion or a really good way of kind of getting at the the heart of the innovative properties of Bitcoin. So could you walk us through that? Yeah, sure, sure. So I, um, I'll, I'll give you sort of the backstory of it in parallel with what the actual research does. So um, I had some colleagues, they were all at Princeton University, and they put together a textbook on Bitcoin. And they asked me to write a foreword uh, where I tried to lay out all the digital cash uh, stuff that people did in the 80s and the 90s leading up uh, to Bitcoin. And uh, one of my co-authors on the book, Arvind uh, Narian, who's at Princeton still, he actually gave a talk at NSF and he wasn't sure what to talk about. So he thought, well, I'll, I'll show the history of Bitcoin and, and basically like the chart that's in that paper of all the different ideas. And so he gave that presentation and everyone like was, was surprised and he got a really positive reaction and they all said, oh, you should write it up. And, and so then we sat together and, and we thought, yeah, we should, we should maybe write it up because it seemed like something that, that was obvious to us, but it wasn't obvious to other people. Um, and so, yeah, so every, like, if you look at the cryptography that's used, uh, so you have signatures, you have hashes, uh, the way the blockchain is constructed, you have this hash chain and these Merkle trees that aggregate things together. Uh, you have this proof of work, which is in the news now because of its electricity. Right. Um, you have just the idea of a whole bunch of nodes coming together and agreeing on the same thing that's called consensus. Um, all of these ideas were tackled in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, and if you read the Satoshi white paper, the original, it does have some pointers. And I remember one light bulb moment for me was um, actually writing that forward, I, I went to the Satoshi white paper and I looked at uh, one of the citations. It was to this paper at CCS by Saber and Hornetta, Stor uh, Haber and Stornetta. And um, I opened up the paper and this was like, you know, five years before Bitcoin or whatever. And the blockchain was there. There was like a picture of the blockchain. And it was exactly the same. And, you know, and it, it just didn't like I, I had actually read that paper much earlier, um, but I, I never made the connection uh, between it. Um, and so anyway, so so it was just sort of uh, trying to shed a light on it. It also for academics, they don't like things that are new. So like often we talk as professors, hey, the Bitcoin paper probably has more citations than any crypto paper that's been written since maybe like the late 70s when like RSA and like Diffie Hellman and like those those like really instrumental papers came out. Since then, like no one's written a paper with the impact that Bitcoin has had. And yet it was never published. Right. And and why is that? And it's because part of it's because it wasn't written in a way that academics would accept it. And maybe we need to do some self-reflection on, on why that should be the case. Um, but part of the problem, too, is, is just that it was so out of left field. Right. And so what we were trying to do is we were trying to drag it back and say, oh, no, it's actually a very sensible protocol that just builds on on all these different ideas. There's like five or six threads that that of published research. And if you just weave them together, that's what Bitcoin is. And it wasn't to diminish Satoshi's contribution at all because he was brilliant because he combined them in a way that was completely innovative. But it was just to give a sort of to put it on common ground with the academics so that they would understand what the contribution is and it give them a way to situate 
what exactly the result was relative to the things that they already knew. So in the, in the last few minutes here, can you give us a list of the three top people you think Satoshi is? <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Um, <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll say a bit about it. It's actually something I've, I've put some thought, I've had to put some thought into for reasons that are under NDAs. Um, <laughs> but uh, first off, I would argue that Satoshi's a single person. Okay. Uh, and I actually say this in the foreword. Um, a lot of people think of Satoshi as the person who wrote the white paper or the person who wrote the code, but not everyone knows that he stuck around for like a year conversing with people, writing things on message boards. and. Just in my mind to have five people manage that account and like, oh, you answered that question and I'm going to answer this question and we're going to write it the same. It's just crazy, right? Oakham's Razor says that at least that person that was like doing all the conversation was a single person. That person clearly understood the whole system. They didn't understand a narrow, they, they could answer any question about any aspect from the economics to the crypto, to the network, to the code, right? They could pull in code for it and approve it and things like that, right? And so if one person could understand it, then one person could have invented it, mm -hmm. right? So I, I, I believe that the simplest explanation is that, that a single person invented it. Uh, mm -hmm. I use the pronoun he because Satoshi's what he chose to call himself, which is typically male. Of course, it could be a she, uh, but, but anyways. Um, and then uh, in terms of the person, I've, I've always maintained that it's probably someone you've never heard of. Right. So everyone wants to say, well, let's figure out who Satoshi is. So let's go look for Satoshi. So we'll look on the Internet. And the only people you'll find on the Internet are like people that had a platform. Right. To, right. to talk about things. So people are like, oh, it's Nick Sasbo or it's Hal Finney or whatever, because you can find posts from them from that time period where they talk about similar things. Right. Right. But there's a whole world of people out there that, that never posted anything about anything. Right. And it could be any of them. And the analogy. Well, the first thing, it's kind of like the, the drunkard who's, you know, he lost his keys and he's looking the under the, the street light and someone comes and they say, oh, where did you drop your keys? He's like, oh, I dropped them over there, but I'm looking under the street light because it's bright here. <laughs> right. I'm not looking where I actually dropped them. So it's, it's kind of the same thing. Um, and then the analogy I like to give is. Uh, let's take it, maybe it's not exactly comparable, but let's take a system like Linux, right? Linux is also open source software. It was written by one person, right? And imagine if Linus, who wrote Linux, this Linus, sorry, uh, decided to be anonymous. Would anyone guess? I mean, he's some Finnish grad student, right? right? He, he right. wasn't, he's not a popular figure. Like, no one's heard of him. No one, you know, people would be like, oh, it must be like these famous Unix people you know, that, that work on BSD and, you know, like they would pull all the famous names out and say, oh, that, that's that got to be the person that wrote Linux because they're the only people that know about how an operating system works. But no, it was just some Finnish grad student that, that you know, no one's heard of before. And so I, I actually think that Bitcoin's the same. I think it's some grad student that you've never heard of before uh, that, that, you know, that, that invented it and then probably got, I, I don't know why they left so there's there's lots of controversy, but maintaining a system is hard. You got to dedicate. It's more exciting to design a system than to maintain it. You also have to maintain your anonymity. That's hard, right? It's if you slip up once, right, then you break your anonymity forever. It doesn't matter how careful you've been, you know, for for five years if you slip up once. Uh, and so, uh, yeah. So it doesn't surprise me that 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 person just sort of left. The project. And, I, I yeah. came I came across a, an interesting quote by Banksy a while back, and he said, uh, "Nobody really cared who I was till they didn't know who I was." Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> that it it, it kind of goes to that idea that you, know, you become much more famous if if there's a mystery involved. Right, uh, right, right. So that that could also be part of the motivation as well. So it could be, although he sort of like towards the end, he was trying to get away from that like reputation as sort of this mysterious founder and it's kind of like a pirate currency and things like that. And and he, he wanted to be seen in a more legitimate light. And so if that was his original purpose, it kind of backfired in a way that I think he recognized himself. Um, Banksy also, I think of like there's Banksy, there's this show Top Gear, they had this like anonymous driver, the Steg. And those are things too, where I think it's kind of an open secret. Like people basically know who Banksy is. Uh, once again, someone you've never heard of. Like, there's the speculation, oh, he's the guy from Massive Attack, because we've heard of him. 
right? But yeah. no, he's just like some grad student, art student, you know, I, I keep harping on grad student, I don't know why, but um, <laughs> and he he's from, like some he's art from student Finland, or whatever. And, Finland too, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, <laughs> and in the stakes case, it's like everyone knew, like you could tell who he was, it's just no one cared. It was an open secret. The press agreed we're not going to disclose the identity. But in Satoshi's case, people care. We know the press cares. We know that that they'll, you know, go knock down people's doors like trying to get interviews with, with <laughs> right. people that they think is Satoshi. And so, yeah, so it, it may be a little different uh, than the Banksy case, but, but I got you. Well, fantastic. That seems like a really fun note to end on. This has been really informative and went down paths I didn't anticipate. So we really appreciate your time. Yeah, I appreciate it as well. Yeah. Very detailed stuff. Um, uh, great insight. Uh, thanks for being on our show. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pleasure.